So it's been a while. It's good to be back with you. Sorry for the uh, uh, misunderstanding last time or lack of communication. It was speaking of Murphy's Law. It was one of those where I was sick and not thinking well at all. And so I asked Steve to notify everyone uh, that uh, class was canceled last time. And you know, my my email was messing up. I couldn't send it out direct. Something some something was wrong. So I contacted Steve, asked him to send it out, and he did. And he didn't find out till the next day that it had kicked back. It had stayed in his outbox, and it never was sent. So he felt terrible. I felt terrible, and some of you showed up and. We but we the good thing about it is all of you went out to Denny's and had a good time. Anyway, it's good to be back. I've, I've missed being here and we have a lot of good material to cover tonight. We are working our way to Matthew 24. And then when we get to Matthew 24, we're going to camp out for a few sessions because there's a lot in that chapter. But one of the things we're going to notice tonight, it's, it's really fascinating to me as you read through, especially Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and even John to a large degree. Uh, the closer you get to the time of his death, the more he speaks about his return. And, and that doesn't seem, you know, and, and he knew what he was going to face. He knew what the crucifixion would be like. He knew what the beating would be like. He knew the pain he was going to go through. And yet, we're going to start out tonight talking about that part of it where he really just kind of skims over it. He doesn't really highlight what he's about to face. He mentions it several times. He lets his disciples know. But it's not like he dwells on it. But the closer he gets to the cross, the more he speaks about his return. And uh, all the way through his ministry, he's doing miracles, he's preaching, he's teaching. He's, then he tells a lot of parables, and he, he just gives a lot of good instruction. He's revealing who he is. And so, but it, there's kind of a change, and we're getting to that tonight, where just about a few weeks before he goes to Jerusalem, that last week before his death, uh, it, it's like his focus changes to the, to the distant future, to his return. And so much of the last several chapters in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and Luke and John leading up to his crucifixion. You read through those chapters building toward his death and you'll read a lot about his return. And, uh, and there are reasons for that. One of the reasons is his death, it took his death to guarantee and purchase what he plans to accomplish at his return. So almost in the mind of God, his first coming and second coming are blended together. And the crucifixion, it, it, the return is just kind of a continuum of the crucifixion and resurrection. It's just kind of a continuous story. And so we'll work our way toward Matthew 24. And I want to deal with an important principle. We're going to start the handout, you see. We're going to start in Matthew 19. 28. But before we get there, I want to talk about an important principle. I'd like you to turn to Deuteronomy 29.29, because this really is going to play a big role in the next few sessions. Deuteronomy 29 and 29. The secret things belong to the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. That word secret is used quite a lot in the Old Testament. It's the, it's the same basic idea as the New Testament word, mystery. And mystery is primarily in the New Testament, secret is in the Old Testament. But both of them speak about the same thing, that there are things 
known only to God, that, that are concealed until such a time he chooses to reveal them. So the two key words regarding secret and mystery is conceal and reveal. Uh, so they are concealed until the Spirit reveals them. And without the Spirit revealing them, we cannot know them. Now, anyone can sit down, a lost person can sit down and understand a lot about the Bible. But the real important truth, spiritual truth, they cannot know. And even saved people, even saved baptized people, even saved baptized people in the church serving faithfully cannot know without a revelation by the Holy Spirit. So this is what the, this principle of these secret things belong to God. And then they are revealed, as it says here, to us by the Spirit. And one of the main purposes of revealing them at the end of that verse that we may do. So the Holy Spirit does not reveal truth to us just so we can say we've learned something. He reveals truth to us so that we can put it into practice. Um, go now to Daniel chapter 12 and verses 9 and 10. So, you know, Daniel is one of the most godly spiritual men Ever. I think we would all agree with that. You would think that he would understand many things that the rest of us or most of us uh, could not know because he was so godly, prayed all the time. The Lord did reveal a lot to him, but in this particular case, Daniel asked for more information. In verse 8, although I heard, I did not understand. Why? Because the Lord chose not to reveal it to him. He heard the words, he just didn't understand what they meant. So I said, Daniel speaking, my Lord, what shall be the end of these things? And he said, go your way. <laughs> In other words, I'm not going to tell you. Go your way, Daniel, for the words are closed up and sealed till the time of the end. There's one of those famous tills or untills that I mentioned a lot, because that's a key word in the Bible. It's a hinge word. It's a word that means at a certain time, uh, then I will reveal it or, you know, the next thing will happen. So sealed till the time of the end. So evidently there are things that we will learn as the coming of Christ gets closer that even Daniel did not know. Many shall be purified, made white, refined, but the wicked shall do wickedly. Boy, we're living in that time. And none of the wicked shall understand, because he's not going to reveal it to them. So as we go closer to the tribulation time, as we go through the tribulation time, a lot of things will be happening, and the wicked will not understand. But the wise will understand that Hebrew word is masculine. It's a really great word. M-A-S-K-I-L-I-M. The wise shall understand. So these often the truths that are, are revealed are revealed in a progressive way. We call it progressive revelation. Uh, as we are able to receive it. Um, we will know the time when the time to know is there. So now I want to go over to Matthew. I put on your handout John 16, verses 12 through 15. That's, the, that's where Jesus told his disciples, this is the night of his arrest. He's walking from the upper room to the Garden of Gethsemane to be arrested. And he says, I have many things to tell you but you're not able to receive them yet. 
So there are things withheld and, and even from us until the future. So that's why I like to say uh, we will know when the time to know is here. And that's pretty exciting to me when you stop and think about it. If the saints, in fact, do go through the tribulation, as I believe they will, uh, we will know exactly what is happening, when it will happen. We'll be telling people this is what's coming next. Most people won't believe us. The Antichrist will try to kill us. But a lot of people will believe and be saved during the tribulation. There will be a multitude, the Bible says. So, uh, I mean, if, if, if you're here in the tribulation, you start saying this is happening next, and after that, that, and after that, that, here's the verse for that, the verse for that, and it all starts happening in that order, some people's eyes will be opened, and they'll, they'll believe. Uh, Matthew 16. I want to show this idea of progressive revelation. Do you know that through most of the ministry of Christ, he did not mention his death? You would think he would. Uh, almost to the, to the, way over halfway through, close to the time of his death is when he started talking about it. And especially, he did not reveal the means of his death by crucifixion. So Matthew 16 Verse 21, from that time, here's where it all started. He hadn't mentioned it before this. Now, Matthew 16 in time order is way past the halfway mark. From that time, Jesus began to show his, to his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem. Must. Not that he's not just saying this is what's going to happen. It must happen. It is God's decree. This is why I came. This is why I was born. Nothing's going to stop it. Uh, and it must happen. Must go to Jerusalem, suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes, be killed, and be raised again the third day. This revelation, this new revelation, the disciples hadn't even been told this yet. They'd been with him the whole way. This revelation was so shocking that Peter rebuked him. Verse 22, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Can you imagine rebuking Christ? <laughs> but that, but it, it shows how shocking the revelation was. He's doing all these miracles. Surely he's going to set up his kingdom. Surely he's going to throw off the Roman Empire. Surely he's, he's the Messiah. He's going to sit on David's throne. Because, see, they hadn't yet understood the truth of the two comings of Christ separated by a long gap of time. To them, all of the prophecies about his first and second coming were going to happen during his ministry. And this idea of dying, raising from the dead, going back to the Father, a long gap of time, and then coming back to set up his kingdom. That had not been revealed to them yet. Why? Because they were not able to receive it yet. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall not happen to you. He meant it so strong, he took a sword with him, didn't he, out to the garden, cut off the guy at Malchus's ear. Jesus said, put away your sword. You're trying to stop from happening what must happen. You have no clue. But he, and, and so Peter rebuked the Lord, and the Lord then rebuked Peter. Turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. That's how, that's how badly they missed it. <laughs> You are an offense to me. How would you like Christ to say that to you? For you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. So this is all in context with uh, verse 16 and 17. 
when Jesus asked them, who do men say that I am? And that, you know, they said different prophets and so forth. But Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. How could he say that? Because Jesus said, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. So the Lord revealed to Peter the truth about Jesus in a deeper way than he had known it before. So that was revelation. But the Lord had not revealed to Peter yet that Jesus had to die. So since that was not revealed to him yet, he rebuked Jesus. And Jesus had to rebuke him. So this contrast to me is really interesting how that Jesus could say in verse 17, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. It's been revealed to you by my father, not by human reasoning. And yet right after that, get behind me, Satan. You're not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. It shows how we are in our flesh nature if we don't have revelation from God of truth. It's a really good contrast there in those, those two places. So, from that time, Jesus began to tell them that he was going to Jerusalem and die. Then we go to chapter 17 and verse 22. Now, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said to them, the Son of Man is about to be betrayed. That's a new element there. He hadn't revealed yet that there would be betrayal involved. He had only told them, I'm going to Jerusalem and I must die. And that was so shocking, you know, how Peter reacted. So he's, he's giving them the full story in stages. Now he adds the betrayal element. Because what he had told them already was overwhelming. They couldn't have handled the whole thing at once. The Son of Man is about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And the third day, so now he adds the, the timing of it. The third day he will be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful, but they're beginning to grasp it. So, a little more information. But he doesn't mention the means of death yet. In chapter 20, in verse 17, now he's on his way to Jerusalem. This is, the, this is a week before his death. Right up close to the time. Then Jesus, going up to Jerusalem, took the twelve disciples aside on the road and said to them, Behold, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be betrayed. So he's including the previous information to the chief priest and to the scribes, and they will condemn him to death, deliver him to the Gentiles to mock and to scourge and to crucify. Now he adds that part of the story, progressive revelation. They couldn't have handled all of this at once. Okay, you say you're going to die. We're just barely grabbing hold of that. You say one of us is going to betray you. We're barely grabbing hold of that. But now you say they are going to scourge you and crucify you. And we've seen you do all of these miracles. And they've tried to arrest you and kill you a number of times. And you didn't allow it. What's going on here? How, are, how in the world are they going to be able to do this to you when we know you have the power to stop it? See, they're having to process all this information. So this is the, the final week in, in chapter 26 and verse 2, right at the end, right at just a day or so before his arrest. 26 and 1 and 2. Now it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, you know, now they know. So he's, he's not revealing new information to them. You know that after two days, so just a couple of days before his arrest and death, 
the Son of Man will be delivered up to be crucified. So not until they were actually on their way to Jerusalem for this final week does he reveal the means of death that is going to be by crucifixion. A part of the reason to conceal this truth, so conceal and reveal, part of the reason it was concealed until soon before it happened, number one, the passage in John 16, 12 through 15, you're not able to receive it. But part of it, I want you to go to 1 Corinthians 2. And then we'll, then we'll move on to Matthew 19, 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. This is, a, this is a fascinating part of this that often is not brought up. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 6. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. Of course, the rulers of this age include the spirit, the powers of the spirit world behind the earthly rulers. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom. If you want to know the shortest definition of mystery in the New Testament, hidden wisdom that is revealed which God ordained before the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers, including the spirit world, none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. That's a really fascinating. In other words, part of the reason he held off telling even his inner circle disciples of his death by crucifixion and his resurrection, he did not want the spirit world to know. Because if Satan and the spirit world and the evil rulers of, of this world, of the Roman Empire, really knew what his death was about and then his resurrection, they wouldn't have killed him. They thought they were getting ready of, rid of a troublemaker or someone who was taking away their power. If they realized that by his death, he was going to guarantee the overthrow of all the powers of this world and of the spirit world at some point, which is at his return, they wouldn't have killed him. So it's... The, it's, it's fascinating. To, he was doing it to hide, hide it from evil men and evil spirit powers. Okay, let's jump into uh, Matthew 19. Even though we're, I wouldn't say racing, that probably is not the correct word, but we're working our way toward Matthew 24 because that's kind of the focal point of so much of, of my sessions. Uh, there are some really interesting and important passages leading up to it that we should not ignore. And this is one of them. Uh, when, of course, it's Peter, as always. Uh, Peter answered, asked in verse 27, answered and said to him, See, we have left all and followed you, therefore what shall we have? You know, that's, you go to any uh any kind of sales lecture, any any kind of um, in the business world, and they'll often what is that, Andy? They'll write on the they'll write on the board. Gary probably seen this many times. They'll write the letters W I I F M. You know, they'll write those five letters, and, and they'll say, "This is the whole reason you work. This is the whole reason you get up. This is the whole reason you try to sell something. This is the whole reason." You get your college degree, it's the whole reason you, you know, whatever, develop your career in those five letters. What's in it for me? Yeah. I mean, that really is the driving force for most people. And this is this, even, even disciples. What's in it for me? What are we going to get out of it? <laughs> so, uh, you know, God understands our nature. He understands what we're like. And he tells us a lot in the Bible what there is in it for, for each of us. 
So Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, now I'm reading from the New King James. I also have the Old King James. If you have another one, maybe I'll ask you to, Ruth, you probably have the New American Standard. Okay, so let me read it from the New King James first. Jesus said to them, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, comma, when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory, comma, you who have followed me will also sit on 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, the old King James reads it like this. Jesus said to them, Verily I say unto you, comma, that ye who have followed me, comma, in the regeneration, when the Son of Man shall sit on the throne of his glory, shall sit upon 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Can you read the New American Standard for us, please? Free post. And Jesus said to them, Truly I say to you, comma, that you who have followed me, comma, in the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Okay, we'll talk about this word regeneration in just a minute, but it shows you the difficulty of translating from one language to another. And, of course, in the original Greek writings, some say Matthew wrote his original copy in Hebrew, be that as it may, whatever other language it was written in, it was not written in English. So when you're trying to translate it over into English, and they didn't use, you know, commas and a lot of the uh, markings that we do today, uh, then your own bias starts playing into, in English, where do you put the commons? And so the old King James reads as if, uh, and this was Brother Worski's position and, and many others, um, that what Jesus is saying is that the regeneration is their personal new birth experience. What Jesus is saying is that you who have followed me after you've experienced that regeneration. In other words, you were saved, regenerated, and then you followed me. So if you've done that after your regeneration, then this is what you're going to get. And that's the truth of the Bible. It's not a, it's not a wrong thing to say. Uh, my position, and depending on how the commas are placed, uh, and the New King James translators, I think, had that, had the bias of my position, and they rearranged the wording of the verse and the commas to make the word regeneration mean when the Son of Man sits on the throne of his glory. That's the regeneration. I have a note in here that says, uh, uh, with the ruling force again for regeneration. Yeah, and that's that's the thing, because the word regeneration itself uh, comes from a particular Greek word. It's a compound word, palingenesia, uh, and palin means again, and genesia, we get generation, we get uh, genetics, we get genealogy. Uh, it comes from a root word that is translated in the Bible as born or begotten. So those are just all a group of words that mean very similar to each other. So Palin Genesia means again birth or new birth. Um, but in a broader sense, it can carry the idea of a new beginning, whether it be your personal salvation or something else, a fresh start. So I added the three points underneath that the word regeneration does apply to an individual experience at the moment of faith. That is your regeneration. Your spirit is born again. It's renewed, regenerated. But the Bible also talks about the regeneration of the nation of Israel at the return of Christ when the Son of Man comes to sit in his kingdom. And it goes on to talk about other things. Uh, sits on the throne of his glory. And then the Bible also speaks about the regeneration of all things. 
meaning creation. Romans chapter 8 talks about that the whole creation groans and travails, waiting for its redemption, its regeneration. Uh, Peter preached in Acts 3.21. Um, maybe we'll just turn to read that real quick. That's a, one of our primary text verses for, for these whole series of sessions. Uh, Acts 3.21 when Christ went back to the Father, he says, whom heaven, 321, whom heaven must receive until the times of restoration of all things. So what is going to be restored? What are the all things that will be restored? Well, the resurrection will get a new body. Uh, the curses will be removed from creation. So it will be a fresh start, a new beginning for creation. Uh, Israel, the, the one-third of Israel that's still alive at the return of Christ, they'll look on him whom they pierced, and a, and a nation will be born spiritually in one day. That's Isaiah 66. So this idea of regeneration is, is really interesting, and I'll leave it to you to decide... <laughs> The, 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 word, the order of words and where you'd put the commas because either one is a truth presented in the Bible. But the regeneration, is it your personal regeneration and then if you followed me after that, this is what you get? Or is it a regeneration describing when the Son of Man sits on the throne of His glory and that's when uh, all things are going to be restored? Yes. I have a, a Christian Jewish uh, Bible. Okay. It says, uh, and Jew, uh, Jesus said to them, Yes, I tell you that in the regenerated world, regenerated. It sits on the floor. So See? Kind of what you're, yeah. <laughs> See, all, all the translators are struggling yes. to determine what does he mean by the regeneration? Should it be connected to when the Son of Man sits in the throne of his glory? Or should is he should it be applied to the personal experience of those disciples that he's talking to? And then they followed him after they were regenerated, and this is what they're going to get. But again, both of those views are true, taught throughout the Bible. So the translators are trying to decide how should we word this in English to get across one view or the other. And uh, that's, that's one of the difficulties of translating from one language to another. But I wanted to also deal with the last part of that verse. You have fallen, will sit on 12 thrones judging the 12 tribes of Israel. Many people take this verse to then teach that this proves that New Testament saints will have a higher position in the millennial than Old Testament saints because this says these 12 at least uh, will sit on 12 thrones. So it obviously it's talking about 12 apostles judging the 12 tribes of Israel. So one thing you need to be careful about is he is talking about 12 apostles on 12 thrones. To broaden that to mean all New Testament saints might not be warranted. He's talking about maybe a particular blessing to the 12 apostles. And then I'll let you decide whether the 12th one is Matthias or Paul. That's, a, that's another debate. But we know who the, at least 11 of them are for sure. And uh, we'll let the Lord decide who will sit in that 12th throne. Uh, the other thing that should be pointed out is that um, how should I say this? That regenerated corporate regeneration of Israel at Christ's return <clears throat> Uh, many verses clearly teach that 
they will go into the millennium as children of God, as disciples of Christ, but not in resurrected, glorified bodies, just in their natural human bodies, even though they will be saved at that point. Uh, I could give you many verses. We'll just take the time to read a couple of them. I'll, let me let me say them to you if you want to write them down, I'll, and then I'll just read a couple of them. Uh, those in Isaiah would be 4, 3, 45, 17, 54, 13, 60, 21, and then in Ezekiel, chapter 20, verses 33 through 44. Now we're going to read one in Isaiah and one in Ezekiel uh, that shows this, and the other verses back it up. Isaiah 59 and 21. And a, a number of the verses I gave you and, and a number of other verses will talk about uh, the those living in the land of Israel at that time are doing human things. They're having children. They're raising crops. They're, they're, they're doing things you do not in glorified bodies. Uh, Isaiah 59, 21. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth so this is when Christ comes, he will, this is the uh, total fulfillment of the promise of pouring out his spirit, because it's going to happen to Israel at his return. It happened on the day of Pentecost, it's going to happen to them uh, when they repent and believe. My spirit who is upon you and my words which I have put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth nor from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants. So there's going to be ongoing bloodlines when this happens, when the new covenant in its fullness, when the Spirit is poured out on them at His return, says the Lord, from this time and forevermore. So an ongoing promise of spiritual blessings and uh, uh, new covenant blessings to the to the ongoing descendants during that time. Um, now, if we go to Ezekiel, this will really kind of spell it out even clearer. Ezekiel thirty nine, starting in verse twenty one. Ezekiel thirty nine, verse twenty one. I will set my glory among the nations. All the nations shall see my judgment which I have executed and my hand which I have laid on them. So the house of Israel shall know that I am the Lord their God from that day forward. He's talking about at his return. The Gentiles shall know that the house of Israel went into captivity for their iniquity because they were unfaithful to me. Therefore, I hid my face from them. And that's been going on for 2,000 years at least now. I gave them into the hand of their enemies, and they all fell by the sword. According to their uncleanness and according to their transgressions, I have dealt with them and hidden my face from them. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, now I will bring back the captives of Jacob and have mercy on the whole house of Israel, and I will be jealous for my holy name after they have borne their shame. They haven't done that yet. They haven't confessed to that yet. They haven't repented of that yet as a nation. In all their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me, when they dwelt safely in their own land, no one made them afraid. When I have brought them back from the peoples and gathered them out of their enemies' lands, 
and I am hallowed in them in the sight of many nations, then they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who sent them into captivity among the nations, but also brought them back to their own land and left none of them captive any longer, and I will not hide my face from them any more. For I shall have poured out my spirit on the house of Israel, says the Lord God. And the other verses I gave you say pretty much the same truth in different wording. And the reason I took the time to do that is because of that passage back in Matthew 19, that promise to the apostles about sitting on the 12 thrones. And, and we think of the word judging differently than how it's used in the Bible. Uh, you know, the, Israel had judges in the Old Testament, but they were not judges in the sense of condemning people whether they were right or wrong like we think of judging. They were their leader. They were their supervisor, their instructor, their deliverer. And I think what Jesus is telling the 12 apostles is that you're going to have a special privilege of supervising that group of Israel that comes through the tribulation, they are saved, they go into the millennial, they're going to repopulate the land. Uh, and this gets into a whole big subject, but I've become convinced that one of the purposes of the millennium is to prove, to vindicate, for God to vindicate himself. That when he gave that promise to Abraham 4,000 years ago, he meant it. I am going to make you a holy nation in your land. And all the nations of the earth are going to see it and admit it. And for a thousand years, the whole world will have to say God meant what he said. He finally was able to do with Israel what it took them you know, over 4,000 years to get to a point where they could be what God wanted them to be. And it's going to be an ongoing witness to the nations um, of what God's intention was from the beginning with that natural seed of Abraham. When you say nation, mm -hmm. are you saying the Jews? Yes. And not just Israel? Uh, they'll be the same at that time. At that point, yeah. The, the, the all twelve tribes of Israel. So it'll be pulled from Europe, U.S., wherever. Back yeah. To Israel. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one way I would describe it, because you know, 1948 they became a nation again, but they're still Jews scattered all over the world, uh, and yet they're going to be saved spiritually at His return. So kind of like two separate events, and 1948 does not fulfill the totality of what he said, a nation will be born in one day. But in a sense, they were. So one way to describe it, it's kind of a catchy way, I like it, is that uh, he brought, he gave the land to Jacob in 1948, he's going to give it to Israel at his return. If you understand the difference between Jacob and Israel, uh, it took a long time for Jacob to become Israel. And uh, I think that's kind of the distinction. One is a physical aspect primarily because most of the nation is still in unbelief. But there's going to come a time it's going to be a spiritual physical nation and uh, still in their, I think, unresurrected, unglorified bodies to live out as a, as a literal nation for a thousand years and with a bridal people represented by the 12 apostles supervising them. And we'll get into these kind of things later, but I, you know, I, I'm just trying to work through all this. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, when Jesus was resurrected, in his, 
He didn't go around regular people anymore. He went around his disciples, but he didn't go out to the multitudes and the crowds and just the regular people anymore. Um, I'm wondering how, what kind of direct contact on a reg daily, regular basis will the bride have with the people living on the earth? I mean, because you're talking about glorified bodies mixing with unglorified bodies. I'm just throwing that out there right now. We'll have to develop that later. Rick, it's interesting. You see Christianity around the world, the largest religion. And I heard there's probably more Christians in China than the United States. And throughout all nations, you have a high degree of Christianity, except in Israel. Israel's like a 1% Christian. And you would think there, being where they are, and they already have a lot of Christian churches, but that's not the case. It's like they have been put almost in a cartoon. You can tell the time. Until the time. Yeah, exactly. And that is amazing because you flip through any religious radio stations or TV stations or read magazines or look on the internet or whatever, and it they make it seem like, I don't know for a fact, I haven't been over there. I haven't researched it personally that way, but they make it sound like there are hundreds of ministries and mission efforts in the land of Israel going on with the gospel and trying to preach to them about Christ and everything, and yet 1%. It's, it's, when God said, I'm going to hide my face from them, he meant it. They're hostile towards the Christians. Yes, they... they I, I got balled out at the waiting Uh, just briefly, Matthew twenty twenty one on your sheet, and, and then I need to gonna run up against the clock here real quick. Uh, when James and John's mother asked for that request to sit on his right hand, one on the right, one on the left, in your kingdom. Uh, the only reason I included this is I'm trying to I'm trying to include every verse I can that says something about the end times are the return of Christ. And the reason I include this is just simply to say that it shows that the kingdom in its ultimate form is still future at his return when he sits as king on his throne. So, you know, a lot of people say the kingdom is the church or the kingdom is in your heart or the kingdom is this, the kingdom is that. But the fullness of what the kingdom means is directly tied to when the king comes back and takes his throne, and that's still yet future. I, I want to make just a few brief remarks about Matthew 21. I have it on your sheet, Matthew 21, 1 through 11. The triumphal entry of Christ, he's coming into Jerusalem for the last time before his death, and, he's, and he knows he's not going to leave there until he dies. And it's only going to be a few days. Uh, and yet, this whole triumphal entry is a second coming picture. Because he will make a triumphal entry into his city when he returns. And he will take over as king when he returns. Uh, but this is, a, this is a great event. It's a historical event, but it's full of second coming language. And the day he came into Jerusalem, riding on that donkey, fulfilling Zechariah 9.9 and verse 5, um, he was the only one who understood what was really going on. You know, they grabbed all those palm branches, they threw their coats on the ground, they're saying Hosanna, they're... They, they, they were hoping that their energy, their excitement, their emotions, because most of them had some level of belief that this could be the Messiah. They'd seen his miracles. They saw him raise people from the dead. They'd, they'd seen enough that there was evidence there. And so now he's come into Jerusalem and... They were trying to receive him as their king. And there's a verse in John 6, at, at an earlier point, it said they tried to take him by force and make him king. 
but he wouldn't allow it because their heart was not right. And I think this is what's going on here. They were trying to like make it happen because most of them agreed he had the power to do it if he wanted to. They'd seen it. So they're, they're trying to make it a reality. But you notice, at least in Matthew's account, as soon as he gets into Jerusalem in verse 12, he goes into the temple and cleanses it. He was showing them, this is my temple. i got to clean it up. And you're wanting me to become your king when you're allowing this to go on in my house? But the importance of Psalm 118 and you can write these verses down if you want. But Psalm 118 is really important to Matthew 21, the triumphal entry and what happened right after that. And so Psalm 118, verse 22 and 23 talks about the, uh, the and it's quoted in verse 42, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing is marvelous in our eyes. But earlier in uh, the triumphal entry, 21.9, both of those are quotes from two different verses in Psalm 118. And uh, Hosanna to the son of David. And every Jew knew that Hosanna was a term reserved for their Messiah. They would not let that word come out of their mouth until their Messiah came. And so they're, they're trying to make it happen. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's another phrase from Psalm 118, 26, was reserved for their Messiah. They were not going to say it. And that's why it's so important that even though they said it and he rejected it at that point, finally, just before his death in chapter 23, in verse 39, if you turn over there, it's, it's, to me, this is real interesting. After he said, your house is left to you desolate, verse 38. For I say to you, you shall not see me no more until, there's another one of those, till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hadn't they already said it a few days earlier? Yeah, but their heart was not in the right shape. But he says, you're going to say it again, and you're going to mean it, because your heart's going to be changed. And so those two times of them saying, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, one was of no effect, but one will be true from the heart. And they're separated by the two comings of Christ. So, but this is a glorious scene, but it's also a real sad scene. Uh, and I'll just kind of s swiftly, I'll just bring this to a close. Uh, you notice what happens when he gets into the city. He rejected their attempt to, to force it to happen. And he, and he says in verse 12, he drove out those. So in other words, he's showing them, this is why I cannot accept your desire. Uh, goes in and he, cl and he cleans it out. And then something really interesting. He became the high priest, the true high priest in his house, the temple. By doing what? Well, they were selling and buying, selling, making profits, trying to argue with each other about the price and turn it into a den of thieves. He said, this is what I really want to go on in my house. Verse 14, the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. What is he, what is he showing here? This is what my house is supposed to be like. Caring for the poor, taking care of those in need, showing love and compassion toward others. And you're over here trying to make a profit by selling these animals at an exorbitant price. So he left them in verse 17 and went out of the city to Bethany. That's the home of Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. And that's the importance of the fig tree story, verses 18 through 22. He, is, uh, he curses the fig tree and it's withered. It looked like it had fruit. It looked beautiful, green leaves. 
surely there's a lot of fruit on there. No fruit. That was Israel. They looked religious. They looked good. They looked godly. Everything just looked super. Why wouldn't Christ just say, good job, nation. <laughs> I'm your king. Let's get going. Let's kick out the Romans. Let's set up the, let's set up the uh, millennial kingdom. No, he couldn't because they were all leaves and no fruit. And that's just, that's the sad part about it all. Okay, so I wanted to get, I didn't really deal with all this part as thoroughly as I would like, but I wanted to get to chapter 22 because next session, I want to make sure we're really equipped to jump into Matthew 24. Maybe not next session, maybe an introduction to 24 because 22 and 23 has quite a bit of groundwork that lays a good foundation for chapter 24. So, but uh, we're, we're getting there and I'm drawing up some timelines and some different, I think it would be really interesting to you once we get to chapter 24. I'm, I, I'm trying to, I'm trying my best that when we get to chapter 24 to be able to lay out a whole framework on one page on a timeline in a real simple, easy to follow method, just plugging in certain key verses along that timeline that'll, I think, make a, a, a lot of large subjects make more sense to you. I hope that's the case. I'm gonna stop this and we can stop the camera and we open it up for questions and, and discussion.